Wanna talk? So let's talk. Good evening and welcome. It's Talk to Solomon time. That's me, Stan Solomon. Thank you for joining us. My co-host. Chief Steve. Former Police Chief Steve Davis, lawman extraordinaire, and also from Freedom Bound, my friend Brent Johnson. Brent, are you with us? Uh, I sure am, Stan. It's a great pleasure to be with you and Steve today. Well, it's always nice to have uh, Brent. He brings us uh, extraordinary experience, uh, true journalism, and uh, occasionally a view that differs from ours. All right, we have a guest uh, his name is Dr. Robert Owens. Dr. Owens, thank you for joining Talk to Solomon. Glad to be with you. Uh, tell folks a bit about yourself. I know you're a college professor. I know you're an ex-pastor. I know you're an author. Uh, and I know you walk on water. Other than that, I don't know much. Well, well, the walk on water thing, I don't know if I'll go that far. But uh, I do teach. I teach for several schools. I teach history, political science, and religion. And I also write a column that is featured in several hundred newspapers and magazines each week. Very good. Well, your, your expertise is in foreign affairs, and we're going to go right there. Um, the, the question of the day is, did this administration, A, know, B, um, react or fail to react, and C, was it disingenuous, which is a fancy word for did it lie to the American people about what took place in Libya? Well, with the information that's coming out today of uh, our own people there, including the ambassador, requesting extra security and it being denied and the fact that security was actually taken away in the weeks before the lead up to the celebration of 911. The anniversary. Um, it's it's hard not to call this dereliction of duty. They obviously should have known and should have been prepared. And when we see what happened, the coordinated attack, and then when we see that the coordinated cover up, it is uh, it's it's just almost unbelievable to see something like this happen in American foreign policy. Uh, Brent Johnson, your, your thoughts about how the media covered this event and your thoughts about this event? Well, I completely agree that um, what happened is a big cover-up, and, and I completely disagree that this is a surprise. Because historically, the federal government lies, misrepresents, cheats, does not say what's really going on, and when it when inevitably it screws up and people die, then it doesn't admit it. It goes out and covers it up. So I have no surprise about that. But you know, I think it's safe to say that the uh, it's not an administration; it's a regime, Stan. Uh, that the Obama, the illegitimate Obama regime, lied, manipulated, uh, and a, a man and his aides died. An ambassador and his aides died in this. But I think it goes deeper than that. I think there is a fundamental flaw in American foreign policy that says that we have the right to stick our noses into every single place in the world. And, you know, we shouldn't have been in Libya in the first place. We should not have overthrown Gaddafi. We should not have been in Iraq. We should not be every place that we have been going. We cause trouble through our imperialism. And I believe that, yes, indeed, this is a major cover-up, but it's not at all a surprise because of America's failed foreign policy. Well, again, I always uh, like Brent's uh, perspective, even though I don't always agree with it. But I agree with you that we should not have been in Libya. We were asked to come into Libya. We should have told the al-Qaeda that we're trying to overthrow the dictator, let themselves kill each other. Uh, Chief. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, Chief. it's interesting that Brent's... Brent's I'd like to say, what I, what I really believe is that we're at a place in American history where 
I put it this way, let's jettison the empire to save the republic. Well, then, yes. uh, not yeah, a bad concept. Yeah. But I'm, I'm, I'm at the place that I think that if you mess with America, we don't bloody your nose, we blow your head off. But that's just me because I'm sensitive. Uh, Chief, go ahead with your thought. No, my first thought was I'm just amazed at how Brent covered all bases and he's really on, <laughs> seemed like on everybody's side. But uh, the first point, you mentioned the media, the media will do anything to help Barack Obama. So they are totally on his side. They will, they will lie, cheat, whatever it takes to get that job done. But it appears to me that Barack Obama really sides with the, with the Taliban and the Muslims. He has some type of a connection there or, or a like for that. But also then the administration or the regime, as Brent put it, they, they, they tend to like the, the Islamic terrorism aspect of this because I, I still say that they feel like any enemy of the United States is a friend of theirs. But also now, that, that when, since they've taken this side, that they can't not let anything go wrong with their, their uh, facade, that if you're nice to them, they'll be nice to us. Uh, Dr. Owens. Now, I, I'll, I'll tell you, it's like a, I don't believe in preemptive war. I, I grew up in a neighborhood in Chicago, and we used to say there, you know, we never start fights, but if you've got to hit somebody back first every once in a while, it's okay. And as crazy as that sounds for kids on the street in Chicago, to make it a national policy is beyond the pale of reason to me. The idea of a, a preemptive war is uh, a republic should not be engaged in this. Afghanistan, that, that would cover Iraq. Afghanistan, I believe, is another story. They, you know, after 9-1-1, and it was known that al-Qaeda was in in there, they were sheltered by the Taliban, they were protected, and the Taliban refused to give them up. I believe we had an obligation to defend our own, our own country, that we should have gone in there and broken everything they had, run them out of power, and wiped them out, as we did. But I also believe that when we were done doing that, we should have told them, okay, we're going home now, but if you do it again, we're going to come back and do it again. And then left. We would have been out of there in six months with a victory under our belt and a chastised Taliban. And now, 10 or 12 years later, we're there and everybody knows the minute we leave, they're walking back into Kabul. Well, I agree with you, uh, Dr. Owens. In fact, I firmly believe that if we had had that attitude in Vietnam, that war would have lasted 90 days. If we had that attitude, the same attitude we had in World War II once we decided we were in it, uh, you just wipe out your enemy, break their will, uh, and then, you know, leave them to starve. Although we don't ever do that. We always build them back up where they're our competition. But we certainly didn't go into Vietnam the right way, and we didn't go into Afghanistan the right way. And, uh, you know, we could all argue about Iraq um, and Saddam Hussein. Uh, the reality is, if you mess with the United States, Saddam Hussein was paying people to kill Americans and and, and to be uh, martyrs, so we just make a martyr. Don't start. Don't uh, go there, Stan. Uh, Brent, I'll go there because it's absolutely true, but I know that deep down in your heart, uh, you know, you're lost. All right. Uh, I, I want to go to the next topic, uh, and that is the, um, the ramifications, in everyone's opinion, of the entire Arab Spring, uh, what's happening there. Some with us, some without us. But the reality is, combine that with what we are saying and what our president is doing with Israel, and do you see, and I'll start with you, Dr. Owens, do you see a pattern, or are we reacting to what happens? Oh, I see a definite pattern. I believe that uh, Barack Obama is uh, in the camp of the Islamists, that he is supporting them. He, look at the Arab Spring, so-called. What did it do? It got rid of people who were supporting us, who are our allies, some of them for decades. And yes, they were dictators. Yes, they were despicable people. But in the world of real politics, in the world of world power, they were our allies. They were holding this area together for us. And we undermined them and set it up so that the Muslim Brotherhood and other radical Islamist factions could take power in these countries and what else can happen besides they are now our enemies and Israel our greatest friend in the area 
has basically been thrown under the bus. And we can see where this is leading. We're, we're going to be pushed out of the whole area. And in many ways, I agree. Let's come home. Bring our troops home. Let's, let's bring our troops here. They don't want us there. Hey, leave. But then they take over the oil, and then they wipe out Israel, in my opinion. But let's go to Brent, who has uh, certainly something to say here. Go ahead, Brent. Well, you know, I regularly hear you say Obama is supporting the Islamists and um, Romney is supporting Israel and Islamists and Israel and Islamists and Israel. But I never hear who talks about what about the American people, the American way of life, the American Constitution, the American Declaration of Independence, the principles, you can call me an isolationist if you want, but principles that say, okay, we are neutral to the world. We have our system. We don't impose it on anyone else. We don't let anyone impose their system on us. With all due respect, Stan, they can cut off all the oil they want. We've got more oil than we will ever need in any of our lifetimes and far beyond if we just open up the oil reserves that are right here in America. I think it's time to stop this thing with, well, he supports the Islamists and he supports the Israelis. Let the two of them work it out among themselves. It's not our business. Let's look out for our own interests. Yes, it's selfish. Yes, it's isolationist. Yes, it's American. Uh, Chief? Well, I think two things are significant with the Arab Spring. One is, I don't believe the American people understand that the, the, the Muslims in the Middle East don't want the same things we want. And so also the, the people that, the Arab Spring uprising, I believe that you never hear Barack Obama talk about terrorism because he doesn't believe those are terrorists. He believes those are freedom fighters. Much different than how we feel about the, the whole thing. I also think there's another part of this that we should discuss, which is you mentioned that we should take care of America's interests, which I really agree with that totally. If there's, if there's a threat to the United States over there, we should go there and do whatever's necessary to protect the United States and our interests, and we, which includes protecting our friends like Israel. But we also should discuss about whether or not we should be in the business of nation building, which I don't believe we should be in. And I agree totally. Now, Dr. Can I Dr. chime in on this again? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm coming right back to you. Go ahead, Dr. Rose. Okay, I, I would have to say I agree with Brent. Uh, you know, I think that uh, America is what we should be concerned with, our own freedom, standing up for our freedom, and be a friend to all but an ally to none. I, I go back to the founders and to our early presidents that we should have no entangling uh, alliances. If we want to help people, help them. But sending our soldiers over there if they're not directly attacking us, I don't agree with that at all. And I also agree with the idea that we've got more than enough oil and energy here. Let them keep their oil. We don't need it. Well, again, well, that I, point is well made. We'd all agree. Of course, Obama well, hasn't let us develop our own oil. But if Romney does as he says he's going to do when he is elected, and he most assuredly will be elected, uh, and opens up the development of all American energy sources, then the Arabs are in, in deep doo-doo because... There's no one left that wants the oil but the Chinese. The Chinese won't pay them. The Chinese will just come take them over. Uh, and that, you know, they're not like America. They, they don't respect other people's rights uh, by any stretch of the imagination. You know, the Arabs were just running around, you know, dating their camels and, and, and uh, making camels of their dates. Uh, uh, before we developed all that, then they just took it over and became, uh, you know, rich. Uh, I promise you, if the Russians had developed it, they wouldn't have taken it over. If the Chinese had developed it, they wouldn't have taken it over. But let's, let's, uh, let me just ask about that, and then we'll come to Israel. Brent, if we just say, all right, we're done with the Middle East, we've got nothing to say, do what you want to do, what should we do, if anything, if China just goes in there and takes over the Arab countries? Like I said, I, I, and I think Dr. Owen said it quite well, that friends, yes, Entangling alliances, no. We should have a limit as to what we're willing to do. Uh, engage in diplomacy. You know, have you know discussions with the Chinese at the various ambassador levels or whatever. I mean, you know, do that kind of stuff. But ultimately, if China was to invade Greater Arabia, it would be up to Greater Arabia to deal with it. Now, you say China would just go in and take over. I don't care how big China is. Keep in mind, the size of China also means the drain and the strain on China, economically and militarily, is massive. So it's not as simple as just numbers. 
China cannot just walk in and take over. Additionally, the Middle East, those countries are well allied with each other against foreign invaders. China would have its hands full and try and take over any one of those countries, much less all of them. So I don't think it's as simple as you say, but I believe that we draw a line. We say, we'll just, you know, we'll, we'll enter into discussion diplomatically to try and help, you know, work it out. But we're not going to get involved militarily unless somebody directly, directly attacks us. Not indirectly by attacking some resources that we could use, but actually comes onto our soil. Okay, that's a different story. Barring that, no, I say that we stay out of it. We change our po foreign policy and we stop sticking our nose into other countries' businesses. Chief. Well, I, I re respect your point of view, but again, uh, like Mitt Romney's speech at the Virginia Military Academy, I believe we have to be in a very big position of strength to even have any of those discussions. So the first thing we need to do is make sure that our military is big enough to back up what we say. Because if we've said up front, we will not get involved other than in discussions, other than in diplomacy, don't bother with the diplomacy because absolutely no one will uh, negotiate. There's no reason for them to do it. Now, Dr. Owens, let's talk about, let's leave Israel and the Middle East alone for a moment, although I think that if we let Israel die, then America is next because there's no way America makes it with, with, with pulling in all its resources and just being defensive. It, it cannot survive. What are your thoughts there? Well, America, you know, we, we, we were a trading nation long before we were an occupying nation in any, any sense of the word. And the world still depends on us as the largest market in the world and also, you know, arguably the largest manufacturer, the largest creator of uh, new technology. And the world's not going to do without America. You know, and so if we just avoided, say we brought it, closed all our hundreds and hundreds of military bases, brought our troops home, and just kept ourselves, we could put our troops on our own border, keep us safe, and had our missions around the world as trading missions. You know, I don't think uh, people are, would attack us. And, and to the idea of China taking over the Middle East, you know, if they want to take their... Uh, their turn in Afghanistan, I guess I'd, I wouldn't mind seeing that. Yeah. All right, well, well said. That's, you know, the Russians failed. We have allowed ourselves Our to fail. We didn't have to have failed. I mean, again, it's a question of if you go into a war to win, you can win or lose. If you go into a war not to offend, you've already lost. We lost on day one, and we had no chance ever of winning. That policy, as instituted by Bush, and carried out by Obama was asinine and insane, in my humble opinion. Chief? Well, it's interesting, uh, being a former military person, I, I believe that the Russians lost in Afghanistan because they don't have any foot soldiers. But I believe we're losing in, in Afghanistan because we don't have any leadership in the White House. Well, again, another uh, possibility. All right, Dr. Owens, you have written a book. Talk to us about your book and what is it about. Well, my latest book is, is called The Constitution Failed. And... It's a provocative title. I do not mean to say by that that the, that the Constitution has always been a failure. Obviously, it created the, the freest, uh, most powerful country in the world and gave space for the dynamism of humanity. You know, and I'm a great lover and a student of the Constitution. What I mean by it is that if you look at the government we have today, we no longer have the limited government that is described in the Constitution. And I believe we need to get back to limited government, back to individual freedom and economic opportunity. And we've become first a mixed economy, and now under this current regime, we're, we're fast becoming a socialist economy and a socialist society. And I believe that we need to do that. And my latest book, what I do, and I do this every week in my articles, I take a current event and I look at it through historical and constitutional lenses, and then I place it in the context of what is happening in America's political scene today. And in this book, The Constitution Failed, I, I take about 45 different uh, situations, each one in a two or three page chapter, that, and I call it Dispatches from the History of the Future. And it lays out how we have stepped 
further and further and further away from constitutional government. It offers some background to how we became a constitutional republic, and then it does offer some ideas about how we could get back. Well said. Well, Brett? Yeah, I think that is very well said. The, the thing that is so obvious to me when we talk about the Constitution that so many people seem to neglect is the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. That means that the government, which was created by the Constitution, the Constitution is the creator, the government is the creation. And the creation, when it does not obey the of the Constitution, those individuals who are failing to obey the Constitution are violating the supreme law of the land. In other words, they are criminals, high crimes and misdemeanors. They are outlaws. They are thugs. That's what you have. That's the obvious reality to me, that the Constitution is fine and the Constitution is in place, but all it is is a law. And you've got people high up in government violating the law. They're not being punished for it. They're not being held accountable for it, which encourages them and the next person and the next one who comes into the same office to do the same thing. You know, if you can keep rubbing banks because nobody's going to stop you, why should you stop on your own? Well, that's like if you keep overthrowing governments and slaughtering the people. But I agree with you, Chief. I want to give the left some credit here because they took over the public education system a long time ago. And so all of our kids that have been through that system have been denied uh, any information, true information about the Constitution, and so which includes many of our elected officials today. And I'd like to see, first of all, the GOP start putting, putting on training information to train their candidates about the Constitution and what's supposed to transpire. And then also something maybe the doctor could come up with, some kind of a test that we as citizens could use to evaluate uh, positions and laws that are that are created by by candidates and, and office holders to see how they match up to the constitution well said uh paul here Do you remember civics remember uh, civics yeah yeah we used to have classes in civics that's right we did government civics whatever you want to call it uh paul here in the studio has said that government is the fire the constitution is the fireplace it keeps the fire within limits we have forgotten that government does not afford us anything. The Constitution tells government what it can and can't do. We are the arbiters, if you will, of whether the government is living within its constraints. The problem is we have failed to do our job. Would you agree, Dr. Owens? Well, exactly. And as many people said when I would, I would say the Constitution failed, the, the statement most patriots come up with is, well, it hasn't failed, we have failed it. But what I think is very instructive, and I wish, wish we could get uh, these classes, civics classes, in my classes in political science, we do discuss these things. You know, but a study of the debate about ratification. If you would read, the, like in, in a good school, maybe you'll be exposed to one or two of the Federalist letters. But if, that's like reading the answer without the question. If we would study the debate and see the anti-Federalist side and the Federalist side, which are juxtaposed, their answers to each other's questions, I think it would be very instructive, such as the the anti-Federalists had one argument. They said any, you know, talking about the Supreme Court, they said any government that is allowed to interpret its own organic documents will inevitably expand. And this is what we have. Matter of fact, if you go back and look at the warnings they gave us about the imperial presidencies, about the bought and paid for Congresses, about all the things that the, the anti-Federalists warned us would happen, under this system, we have them all today. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Hills Hillsdale College has some online courses that address those very issues. Uh, I don't know if anyone has perused them, but they're they're excellent. They're absolutely excellent. All right, we have just a minute left here. I'm gonna give it to Dr. Owens. Dr. Owens, uh, uh, give your website and how people can get your work. Well, if you would go to drrobertowens.com, that's all one word: drrobertowens.com. That's where is, I call that the history of the future. Every week there's a, a new article there, and there are links to, to uh, my books and to 
um, interviews. Hopefully, I'll be able to put up a link to this interview up there. And um, my books are all available through Amazon.com to just put in Dr. Robert Owens or Robert R. Owens. And uh, my books are all on, I have four books on the market right now, and they're all at Amazon.com and many, many other sources. We will send you, we'll send you the link so you can put up this interview. Uh, we have your email, so we'll send that to you. Uh, Brent, a comment? Stan, comment? Yeah, yeah, final comment. I would use the following for The government is a lion. The Constitution is the whip and chair. And the American people are the lion tamers. Well said. Well said. All right, thanks, everyone. We'll be back shortly with Ted Schubert, uh, son of a former PLO terrorist. This is Talk to Solomon. You have a computer, if you're alive today, which means you have a hard drive, which means it's going to break down. Mosey, the backup people, for thousands, for Stan, for thousands of people, for tens of thousands of people, is simply common sense. You go to cpnlive.com, click on the icon for Mosey, the backup people, and sign up. It's, it's just a few dollars a month. Let me tell you something. We had a break-in. They stole our whole computer. You know what? When they take the computer, you can't recover anything, but we had Mosey. We had the backup. We were able to restore everything simply by buying another computer. CPNlive.com, click on the icon for Mosey the backup people and give yourself common sense, peace of mind, great value, the best thing you've ever done. Sooner or later, it's going to be Mosey the backup people. I like to eat. You like to eat? We all do. And usually we run to the grocery store, we run to the convenience store, uh, or we have something in the fridge. But power's been out in parts of this country in the last few weeks. Uh, we don't know what's going to come down the pike economically. Smart people are putting in food. Alpine Air Gourmet Reserves is a line of foods that you can put away that will last for a very long time. You know, they say eat what you store and store what you eat. This is great tasting stuff, healthy for you, a full line. You go to our website, cpnlive.com, and click on the button for Alpine Air Gourmet Reserves and see all the different things we have. This is good tasting food. It's reasonably priced. It will last. And it's worth its weight in gold if a problem arises. I know you don't think there's going to be anything that goes wrong. Actually, you do. This is smart. This is smart insurance. This is smart preparation. This is smart thinking. You have kids. You have a spouse. You have parents. You have dependents. Uh, you have an appetite. All those things can be addressed by a, a, a frugal but smart investment in Alpine Air Gourmet Reserves. Try them out. You will be tickled to death with the taste of them. You know what? In many cases, people start to eat this, and they think, heck, this tastes better and costs less and what you're going to the grocery store and buy. CPMLive.com, check it out. Hey, my name is Stan Solomon, and you know if I have something to say, I'll say it. And I'll only tell you the truth because I'm a Republican, not a Democrat. Democrats always lie. Republicans only lie half the time. I don't lie at all. This is the fuel mule. It's an extraordinary product that was developed by a friend of mine, an engineer, and it increases the fuel mileage on your vehicle. If you have a combustion engine, this will increase your mileage by 10 to 20 percent. It bolts around your fuel line. You can install it yourself or have your mechanic do it. It is an extraordinary item and it flat works. I've been using it for more than 10 years. It's increased my mileage on every vehicle I put it on. And by the way, it will last forever. You can get rid of your vehicle. Just take it off and put on the next one. Go to cpnlive.com. You'll have more information there. You can order it right there. We absolutely guarantee you'll be satisfied. The Fuel Mule. It's a way to kick down your cost of fuel and kick up your mileage. Don't you love the name? I thought of it. The Fuel Mule. Let me ask you a question. 
Do you like being sick? I have in my hand an incredible product. It's called TR10 Super Colloidal Silver. TR10 stands for a trace to the negative tenth power. The particles in this silver product are six to eight angstroms, six to eight ten billionths of a meter. Now listen to me. Silver has been the magic bullet for all of human existence. The Egyptians used silver instruments. We use silverware. They put silver in your teeth because nothing can grow on silver. Silver will kill anything but liberalism. I'm working on that. This product, you go to cpnlive.com, buy one quarter of this product, it will last you for a very long time. Anytime you feel like you've been exposed to something bad, take some of this product, spray it in your mouth, or take a little bit and gargle it, swallow it, it will kill any pathogen. The average antibiotic kills 10 to 20 different pathogens. This product will kill 700 plus. Do yourself a favor, do your family a favor, do your doctor a favor, he's tired of seeing you. Get super colloidal silver, go to cpnlive.com, order the product, it's $29.95 plus shipping, I think it's $39.95 delivered any place in America right to your door, it's worth 10 times that. Check it out, if you're not 100% happy, just return it and we'll give you your money back.